I want to talk to you this morning just for a moment on adversity, a tombstone or a stepping stone. There's a quote from Martin Luther King. I'm sure you've heard it. It says, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. You know, it's not on the mountaintops, which we thank God for those times where you really understand and realize the, who a person is, but it's when they're going through the valley of the shadow of death that you begin to realize who someone is. I want to talk to you, first of all, going through the fire, or I couldn't decide on this first, this first point, so I gave it two points. Going through the fire are between a rock and a hard place. There it is. Turn with the Bibles to Psalm 77. We're going to start there today. Psalm 77. I'm going to welcome our stream church, Pastor Ed and Cheryl. They just had an anniversary. Happy anniversary, guys. Or was it a birthday? Well, one of them. Uh, anniversary, yes. Happy anniversary. Also, uh, Lance and Paula had anniversary. Let's wish them a happy anniversary as well. 30, how many years? 36? 36 years. Outstanding. It says, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of, I tr in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. That was a good thing to seek the Lord in the day of trouble. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My, my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. Interesting. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. The psalmist here, let me just stop there for a moment. The psalmist obviously is going through a trial. How many have been through at least two trials in the last 15 years? At least two. So you know what he's talking about. So he's going through, he's going through the fire. He's between a rock and a hard place. And he's going through the fire so strong that it is hard for him to even sleep. Have you ever been there? Pacing the floor, you know, can't rest, you know, just thinking about the problem, the issue. And he says, I complain. And that's something a lot of people do when they're going through the fire is that they begin to complain. God, why? Why did this happen to me? Lord, why am I going through this? Lord, what are you doing to me? Lord, why, why, why? And he says in verse 4, you hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled I can't even speak. I mean, that's really severe. He's going through the trial so strong he can't even speak. He said, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart and make my spirit makes diligent search. He's meditating. Remember, meditation in the Hebrew means to mutter or to speak. So instead of him meditating on the promises, he's meditating on the problem. Are you with me? You know, you know my job is about to come to an end. You know, my marriage is on the rocks. You know, you know my children this. Or, you know, I, I, the doctor diagnosed this. So he's meditating on the problem instead of the promise. And then the questions come. Will the Lord, verse 7, cast off forever? Is God done with me? Is it over with? How many ever thought that? Let's be real. I have. Lord, are you even out there? Is there somebody else up there? Will he be favorable no more? Has God's favor ended in my life? Did I do something that his favor is no longer real in my life? Has his mercy ceased forever? Is God no longer merciful to me and my family because I'm going through these things? Has his promise failed forevermore? Verse 9, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in, has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? In other words, is he mad at me? We've all thought that one. So he's going through the fire, meditating on the problems trying to find some answers and not getting the answers. How many of you have prayed and you didn't hear anything at times? How many know sometimes God doesn't say anything? He reserves that right, doesn't he? 
But sometimes we take his silence for not moving on our behalf. That's why we have to go back to what he's already said. Come on, are you with me? This is what he's about to do. Verse 10, he says, and I said, this is my anguish, but, somebody shout, but. but. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Even though I'm going through the dark night of the soul, even though I'm going through the fire, even though I'm between a rock and a hard place, I will remember the years that God was good to me, how God brought me out, how God delivered me, how God set me free, how God did miracles for me, how God saved my soul, how God did a miracle in my family. I will remember the testimony of a God who has been good to me. Everyone goes through trials. Everyone. That's not a lack of faith. That's just how life is. I remember a story of a famous minister, Kenneth Hagin, by the way. He's going to be with the Lord. And he was praying for a lady at the prayer line. And the lady come up to him. She says, I want you to pray for me. And he says, what do you want me to pray for you about? He says, I want you to pray for me that I'll never have any more trials. Guess what his response was? Lady, if I pray that, I'm going to have to pray that you die. <laughs> because as long as, and this is a faith man, as long as you're going to live in this life, you're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have adversity. You're going to have challenging moments. But let me tell you something. I got good news for you, new beginnings. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver you out of them all. Robert Shuler used to say, tough times never last, but tough people do. He began to think about what he had instead of what he didn't have. Very key when you're going through the fire. I was talking to a man at the gym that I, I tried to minister to some, uh, some time ago, an elderly man who's a very nice gentleman. He's got some real physical issues. And... He was actually one of the few people that declined me praying for him, which usually everyone's like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know, and these are people that are not believers. Like, yeah, work your stuff. <laughs> so he didn't at the time, and I was respectful of that, of course. And so, you know, I'd see him every time, every now in the gym, and, you know, we talk for a moment here and there, and very nice gentleman. So I think about two weeks ago, I was on the treadmill. I just ran a little bit, and I was stopping, and I was just walking on the treadmill. He comes up beside me. He just got to the gym. And uh, I looked over and said, how you doing today? He said, not very good because of his physical issues. And I said, well, at least you made it to the gym today. And I said, I looked, at, and I waited for a few seconds because I do pray for this man. I pray for his not only his healing, but I pray for his salvation because, incidentally, his wife is a believer. So I said to him, sir, do you know I pray for you? And then he says this, well, is, he's not listening. And, you know, then something just kind of rose up in me. I, didn't, I wasn't disrespectful, but just something just rose up in me. I said to him, and, you know, being a younger man, I was still respectful to him. I said, sir... You need to quit focusing on what you don't have and start focusing on what you do have. He just looked at me, just went quiet. And I said, man, you got a, you got a wife that prays for me. You can't go wrong. And then he, this, is, this, is, this is another thing he says to me. After a few moments, he says, you know, because it started registering with him. He says, you know, I have a mirror by my bed. And when I wake up in the morning, I put the mirror to my, to my mouth to breathe to make sure I'm alive. And I said, sir, I thank God you're alive today. And I always, it is always a pleasure to see you. And he just smiled. Many times we focus on the things that we don't have instead of focusing on what God has already done for us. 
You know, if God never did anything else for us, it would be way more than enough. When I gave my life to Christ when I was 17, I was so, I just got so turned on. I, God just touched my life, brought me out of darkness, brought me out of rebellion, brought of anger. And man, I, I, I was just ready just to just lay my life down for, the, for, for Jesus Christ. And I remember going to the altar. I went to the altar many times in those days. But that's a good thing. And I remember saying, God, if you never do anything for me, if you never bless me, if you never do anything for, for me, I will serve you the rest of my life. Because what you've done for me is more than enough. I cannot thank you enough. And there has been some times where it felt like he, had, he answered that prayer. <laughs> but I know he's always been with me. He says in verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of all your deeds. Listen to this, verse 13. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Think about that for a moment. God's way is not in the club, folks. It's not in the pub. Come on, it's not on the dance floor. Even though I know you like to get down, shake your body down to the ground. <laughs> it's not in the bottle of a, a Jack Daniels bottle. It used to be that way for me. It's not at the end of a blunt. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. God's way is in the house, in the sanctuary. If you're going to find out which way you need to go, this is where you need to be. Because this is where truth is being proclaimed. This is where the way of God is being declared. This is where the direction of God is being released. And if you're going to know where God wants you, it's going to be in the house of God. Your way, oh God, is in the sanctuary. Let's go back to verse 11. He says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Very important. Remember in the Bible, or in the Hebrew, means to bring someone to mind or to act upon that person's behalf. Someone he also said, remember also means to do again or to do time again. Now, in the Hebrew thought or understanding, time is not linear, time is circular. Mean, time is not just in a straight line. Time is circular. It keeps coming back. That's why we celebrate the feast every year. We keep coming back because it's a time of remembrance, not just so that we can remember or take to mind, but also it is an invitation for heaven to do what heaven did before. So when we remember, we're inviting God to do time again. But we remember we're inviting God to move on our behalf. It's not just having a fond remembrance, but we are saying, Heaven, I will call to mind what you have done for me. I will remember every testimony because right now I need you to do it again in my life. Do it again. There's a story about a rabbi who's a believer in Jesus, I heard the story, and in his congregation, there are those who had received healing, and there are those that had still needed healing. So this is what he did. He would send those who were healed to those who were not healed yet. And guess what they did? They would stand over them and just share their testimony. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They're remembering what God has done. Because remember what we've always learned. If when you see God do it for someone else, God is no respecter of persons. He is not partial. He is not racist. He's not prejudiced. He will do the same thing for you if you will just trust him, if you will just believe him, if you will remember what God has done. He will do it for you. So as they begin to share their testimonies to these people, they begin to get healed. Because they begin to call to remembrance what God has done. 
and they began to see God do it again. When we decree what God did yesterday, the same power that was released then is released now. That's why I love to have testimonies of people who have encountered God because it releases faith in those who hear. It causes an expectation for those who hear to let them know, guess what? God will do it for you. But we must begin to meditate on the promises and not the problem. See, before your deliverance, before your deli deliverance is your dilemma. Before the testimony is the test. Many times we have to go through the test to see the testimony. We go through the valley before we get to the mountaintop. But guess what? God is the same in the valley as he is on the mountaintop. He has not changed. Come on. His power is no different. He is the same God today, yesterday, and forever. <laughs> He says, verse 14, you are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. Listen to this, verse 16. He says, the water saw you, O God. Now, at this point, he is remembering how God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea. A rock and a hard place. Listen to this. The water saw you, O God. The water saw you and they were afraid. The depths also tremble. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Your arrows flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Let me tell you something. God will shake heaven and earth just to get to you what he promised. He will shake everything up. He will move things around. He will arrange things just to get to you what he has promised. That's how good he is. See, God will lead you to a brick wall sometimes. Why? Is he being a sadist? Is he love to see you in pain? No. God will lead you to a brick wall at times. Why? So you'll put up your hands, not in despair, but you'll put up your hands and surrender. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know what to do. I don't have the answers. But, Lord, I give up, and I lean on your everlasting strength. I lean on your mercy. I lean on your grace. Because, God, you know how to get out of this thing. So I'm trusting in you right now. I'm trusting in you right now. I don't know what to do, but you know what to do. So you tell me what to do because I am your son and your daughter. The Bible says those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. That means sons and daughters are led by the Spirit. You know, I think about Jesus when he walked when he was in the boat sleeping and the disciples were having, they were tripping. <laughs> you remember the story. They're like, we go die. <sighs> Jesus sleeping in the boat, y'all. <sighs> we go die. He's still sleeping, not even moved. I love it. We go die. I love what Bill Johnson said. He says, you only have authority over the storm you can sleep through. <laughs> wow. You know, we could just end right there. <laughs> you only have authority over the storm you can sleep through. Let that sink in for a moment. God's way was in the sea. See, it's in the places where we cannot always trace his footsteps that he is leading us. He will make a way where there is no way. 
if you just trust him. See, you don't always need to know the route. See, if you like me, I want to know how to get there. Give me a heavenly GPS right now so I can stick it, come on, in my little contraption that's stuck to my window so I can know A, B, C, and D. I want to know the whole route. But heaven does not give you, come on, a heavenly GPS. He'll give you from point A and maybe to point B, but the rest of it, you'll have to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. Oh, Lord, uh, just wait and listen, and he will lead in God and direct your steps. He just needs you to trust him. He just needs you to trust him. See, the most secure place to be is wherever God wants you to be. That may be in the middle of the valley. But if that's where God wants you right now, not that he brought the valley on you, because he didn't bring it on you. You know, there's a saying, you've heard it before, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Don't build a monument, come on. Don't build a tent, come on. Just keep moving, come on. Keep moving, keep walking. I don't see where I'm going, just keep moving. But it's fog everywhere, just keep moving. Come on somebody, because the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. See, when God brings you through something so impossible, two things happen. It causes others to realize how great and powerful your God is. And it also sends a clear message for no one to ever mess with you again. What did God say to the children of Israel that day when the Red Sea opened? The enemies that you see now, you will never see them ever again. May you never see the enemy of debt again. May you never see the enemy of sickness again. May you never see the enemy of cancer again. Because God is able to destroy your enemies. (laughs) The degree to which you trust God is the degree to how secure you will be. The degree to how much you trust God is the degree to how secure you will be. It could be chaos all around you, but if you can trust him, you'll go right through unscathed. That's why I love the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, back in the day, they used to call them Shadrach, Meshach, and one bad Negro. Come on, somebody. I don't know. (laughs) That's what they used to say, you know, I'm just saying. They walked through the fire, guess what? When they came out, didn't even smell like smoke. Clothes weren't even burned, come on somebody. In other words, it looked like they had never been through the fire because what God is bringing you through right now, what God is taking you through right now, what God is delivering you through right now, when you come out on the other side, it will be as if you never was in it. But you will have a testimony of the power and the miracle and the grace of God. And the unbeliever, the unbelieving king looked in and said, I see. I see, I see a fourth man. And he even said, it looks like the son of God. See, guess what? See, what you're going through right now, there's the fourth man. Come on, somebody. 
He's right there in the fire. He's right there in the midst. Come on, he's right through the, with you in the adversity. He's walking with you to take you through because God is right there to get you to the other side of victory. On the other side of your adversity is your victory. Real quickly, let's end here. I want to, I want to give you some points on how to turn a tombstone into a stepping stone. Remember this, though. Remember this. Adversity causes some to break, others to break records. But guess what? See, you and I are made from a different material. Come on, we're made from heavenly material. Come on, come on, we got, we got God inside of us. Come on, we got the Holy Spirit inside of us. We come from a different world. We have dual citizenship. Come on, we're seated in heaven, but we're living on the earth. Come on, somebody. And let me tell you something, what you're made of, you weren't made to be a loser. You weren't made to be one who never sees victory, but you were made to win. You were made to overcome. You were made to make it through any adversity that has ever come against you. And the problem will not break you, you will break a record in this situation. That's what's happening right now. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's raising up record breakers in the spirit. They're going to go where they've never gone before. They're going to do what's never been done before. And you might have to go through the fire. But guess what? You're going to come out unscathed. And you're going to come out victorious. And you will have a testimony that said, guess what? This is what the devil tried to do. He tried to assassinate me. He tried to take me out. But I'm still standing. You're still standing. You're still standing. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up the fight. Guess what? God is coming through for you. He's coming through for you. I said he's coming through for you. There are times I'll just get in my office and I just lift my hands. I say, Daddy, Daddy, I don't have an agenda today. I'm not asking for more anointing today. I'm not asking for more wisdom. And that's all right to do any of that. I just want to thank you for what you've done. I thank you for my wife who survived death. I thank you for my sons, Lord. I thank you, God, for the shoes on my feet. I thank you, God, for the socks I got on. I thank you, God, for the hair I got on my head. I thank you for the clothes I got on my back. I thank you for the home I'm able to live in. I thank you, God, for everything, for the breath that I'm able to breathe. I thank you when I got up this morning, I was able to see the sunrise. I was able to see the goodness of God. I thank you for all that you've done for me because you've been so good to me. I just want to thank you, Lord, for every little thing, every little thing you've done for me. I am grateful for all that you've done. Number one, run to the refuge. Don't run to the bar. Don't run to the club. Don't run to the pub. Run to Jesus. <sighs> run to the wreck. God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in the time of what? trouble I run to him and let me tell you this don't let prayer be a last resort let prayer be your first defense you know when people get into trouble oh God if you get me out oh God I don't know no if you let it be a first defense instead of a last resort Run to the refuge. Number two, take inventory of what God has done for you. Remember the testimonies, not just in your life, but even in other lives. Listen to them. Listen to them. Let them go in your spirit. Let your faith be encouraged. Feed your faith and starve your doubts. 
Speak about them. Mutter, speak. Meditate on the promises of God. Speak them to yourself. Speak them to your situation. Speak them to your life. Let me tell you something. Every time Jesus was faced with a situation he didn't like, guess what he did? He spoke to it. And he didn't speak to it in agreement. See, when God created the heaven and the earth and he walked out and there was nothing but what? Darkness. He didn't say, wow, it's pretty dark out here, ain't it? Gabriel, it's dark, ain't it? You know what? I think it's getting darker. No, he stepped, he spoke light where there was darkness. He spoke life where there was death. Come on. He spoke creation where there was no creation. He spoke the opposite of what he had because he didn't like the situation, so he decided to do something about it, and he decreed and declared the opposite. This is the year of the mouth, 2020. In the Hebrew, this is the year of the open mouth. Open your mouth and decree a thing and declare a thing and speak a thing and confess a thing and God we will bring it to pass. This is the year to decree like you've never decreed before. Kings, only kings are able to make decrees. Guess what? You're a king. You're a king. Use your kingdom, your kingdom authority and decree things. Job says you will decree a thing and it will be established and light will shine on your ways. That means there will be no darkness around you. Your way will be lit up because you are decreeing and saying what heaven says. <sighs> Number three, meditate on the promises, not the problems. Meditate on what God said. Say what God says. We know this. Sometimes we have to be reminded. Meditate on the promises, the promises, the promises, the promises. See, let me tell you something. God's word never sinks. Did you hear what I just said? God's word never sinks. It will always float in every situation. Let me tell you something. It will always float. Paul said, the, I may be bound, speaking of when he was in prison for preaching the gospel, he said, I may be bound in chains right now, but the word of God is not bound. So what do you do? You strap on, come on, your life preserver, the word of God. Strap it on. And guess what? You will always come to the top. Number four, speak to the situations of your life. We talked about that in Mark eleven twenty two. Number five, praise God continually. And you know, I think there's a song that says, this is how I fight my battles. Mm. Number six, develop an attitude of gratitude. Develop an attitude of gratitude. God, I just thank you today. I just give you praise. And just spend the whole time in prayer just thanking him. Just keep thanking him. Because guess what? When you begin to thank him, <laughs> wow. See, I know when my kids, when they were small, when one was very grateful, you know what my tendency was to do? To lavish on them even more. So you're appreciative, huh? Okay, well, here's some more. Come on. Are you appreciative? Okay, here's some more. Oh, you're, you're appreciative. Here's some more. That's the same way God is. Not that we're trying to manipulate him, but we're honestly, we are honestly, we are in gratitude for what he's done. And as we begin to do that, he say, you know what? My children, they are really appreciative of what I've done. I want to do more for them. Yeah. 
I end with this. The gates of your greatest breakthrough are formed from your greatest struggles. Doesn't mean that God put that on you. Okay? It doesn't mean that God put sickness on you. Because why would Jesus pay for the price for you to be healed and then turn around and put sickness on you? That does not make any sense to me. Why would he break the spirit of poverty just to put you into poverty? Come on. You remember the seven places that Jesus shed his blood? Come on. He broke every work of the enemy. Why would he try to bring these things back on you when he broke the power of poverty? He broke the power of sin. He broke the power of sickness. He broke the power of generational curses. He broke the power of limitations. God's bringing you through. God's bringing you through. God's bringing you through. And you're going to be a testimony. See, you know what happens is, is what happens many times is God may bring you through something just for someone else. Seriously. Remember, our life is not our own. Come on, we've been bought with a price. The Father knows what's best. So sometimes God will bring you through something just so you could be a testimony to someone else. And you're wondering why, why am I going through this? Why am I going? Because God's using this testimony to not only do something for you, but something for them. That's why Lion's testimony is going around the world. That's why Pastor Tiz's testimony is going around the world. That's why your testimony is going around the world. Because people need to know that there is a God of hope. There is a God of comfort. There is a God of miracles. That God is not dead, but he's still alive. And know this. Your breakthrough will affect generations. When the children of Israel went through, they went through out of Egypt and they went through the Red Sea. That breakthrough was a breakthrough for generations to come after them. So God's not just breaking you through, he's breaking in your children, your children's children. Come on, somebody disciples and people that God has caused you to influence he is breaking things through just for them through you your breakthrough is their breakthrough so guess what share it freely we have received freely we give So open your mouth and tell somebody what God's done for you. That's really what witnessing is all about. You don't have to get all tight and, you know, uh, you know and, and get all afraid. You really don't. Just begin to share. You know, well, let me tell you something what God's done for me. That's a testimony right there. That's, that's a witness right there. Remember this, I end with this, adversity causes some to break, but others to break records. You're going to break records in your life. You're going to break records in your generation, in business, in ministry, in your destiny, in your home, in your marriage, in your health, in your finances, in your corporation. You are going to break records. Adversity will not be a tombstone, but adversity is your stepping stone. Give God praise today. Come on. It's your stepping stone. It's your stepping stone. It's your stepping stone. It's, stepping stone. it's a step up. Come on. It's a stepping stone. It is not the end of you. It is the beginning of you. In Jesus' name. We got 11 minutes. You can take your seats. We got 11 minutes. Real quickly, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You've come to the right place. 
because there, but everyone here is in love with Jesus. We have a testimony of what God has done for us. God has set us free, brought us out of so many things, and we stand here today not perfect, but we stand forgiven. We stand justified. We stand free. God delivered me from rebellion. He delivered me from a heart of anger. He delivered me from going in my own direction, in my own way, turned my life around. Gave me something to live for that was real. Because all I wanted was something to live for that was real. I didn't want religion. I didn't want somebody to play games with me. I wanted something that was real. I didn't think church had what, had what it takes. Because I was looking at religion. I was faced with religion. I'm like, I don't want religion. I want something that's real. But when I was confronted with relationship. When I was confronted with the fact that God loves me, he's not mad at me, he, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me, and if I will humble myself, repent and ask forgiveness of my sin and invite him into my heart, he will be my Lord and Savior. And the moment I decided to do that, you know, people say I found God. You know what? God found me because I was lost in the darkness I was lost in the darkness, and he found me and rescued me. I remember the pit that he pulled me out of. And guess what? I am not going back. I remember where he brought me from. And wherever you're at right now, God will do the same for you because God loves you so much. The Bible says the wages or the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you will surrender your heart to God, what Jesus did for me, what he did for Pastor Luke, what he did for anyone else here, he'll do it for you. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him shall never perish but have life that lasts forever. This is the God we serve. He is a good God. He is a good God. If you're, if you're here today, I want every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You don't know the Lord. Maybe you don't even believe in God, but you sense something in this place that's very real and very tangible. It is the presence and the love of God. And I believe that the Spirit of God is drawing you to himself. Because the Bible says no one can come to God unless the Spirit draws them. I believe the Spirit of God is drawing people that are watching by stream today. God is drawing those that are here. And if you don't want, if you want to leave this place right with God today, let me tell you something. Let me ask, let me ask you a question. If you die today, where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? You can know today where you're going as you surrender your life to Jesus today. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you're away from God. You once walked with him, but you're away from God today. But God is dealing with you to come back home. This is your day to return back to the arms of the Father. His arms are outstretched waiting for you. And if you're here today and you want to surrender your life to Jesus, pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for me. You rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin, all that I've done wrong. Come into my heart right now. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give my life to you. Satan, get out of my life. Get out of my mind. Get out of my body. Get out of my home. Get out of my life. I close the door on you right now. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, you died for me. Starting today, I'm going to live for you. And I thank you that you are my Lord. Amen.